Right. So <clears throat> go ahead and get started here. So my name is Micah Wood, and I've been doing WordPress development for uh, over 15 years. <laughs> and um, along the way, learned some things about uh, software architecture and uh, wanted to kind of share. Um, I think software architecture, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of aspects. There's way more than we could possibly cover in an hour. But I uh, wanted to kind of introduce some of the basic concepts uh, and uh, the things I found helpful in working with WordPress. So uh, that is where we will start. Uh, we do have the chat. If anybody has questions as we go, I do have the chat open on another screen and do look at the questions. Um, so I'll try to keep up with that as we go and we'll make it as interactive as we can. Um, so hopefully uh, this will be helpful. So <clears throat> first, before we get too much into the architecture, we kind of want to take a step back and just look at the software development life cycle, right? So what, is, what does it look like? Uh, what, what is it that we're trying to, um, to pay attention to? Uh, so I think most people, the average person, developer, I should say, who is building something typically only does the things that are on the top half of the gray bar. Uh, they figure out what the requirements are. They go ahead and build it based off of what's in their head. And then they do whatever maintenance is required to keep it running that the client or, or improvements that the client may ask for. Uh, there's a few things that kind of get overlooked a lot of times. Number one is how should we build it, right? Like, have we really considered all the options? Is this really the best way of doing it? Uh, and then the quality assurance, right? Like, you know, did we build it the right way? Did we test it all the ways that we should have tested it? Um, and so I think a lot of times as we build things, we're more likely to start doing the quality assurance before we start doing the design. <laughs> um, I mean, we do think about the design, right? Like we, we have a concept in our head of what that is. Um, but we don't necessarily commit as much time to that as we probably should. Um, and I think as long as we can kind of understand some of the design patterns and some of the um, uh, principles behind the architecture, uh, it gets easier and easier to kind of reason about, well, this is probably a better way of building software. Um, so on that note, um, we're gonna kind of look at it also from the client's perspective, right? So what is it that the client cares about? Um, ultimately it kind of comes down to three different things. So number one, you know, what is, what is it going to cost me? Right. The client wants to know, is this going to be a super expensive endeavor? Is it a cheap thing? Um, and then the other thing they want to know is, you know, how long is this going to take? Um, and then essentially how effective is the solution going to be? And by effectiveness, uh, there's some nuances there, uh, for the most part, Effectiveness means it serves the purpose or the goal that the client has in mind. So basically the software does what it's supposed to do. Um, but at the same time, effectiveness is the software will last as long as the client needs it to last uh, to serve their purposes, right? Uh, so that means maintainability. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, but essentially it all kind of boils down to these three things. When we're looking at a project, um, the uh, difficulty of making changes to a project, the further it goes on in the delivery process um, can make things very difficult to implement. So in other words, if we have a design and the client says, hey, we want to we wanna change uh, the way this layout is, or we want to make this button do something different. Um, that's pretty easy to do in the design stage, right? Like you just, you know, move the button or do whatever it is you need to do there. And visually it changes, but obviously we haven't built anything yet. So it's it's easy to do. Once you get into the implementation, um, you know, changes are gonna be a little bit more costly. Um, it's possible that as you are still in the implementation phase, you might not have completely built out the thing that needed to change. And, um, <clears throat> So there's that, uh, but suppose, you know, maybe you've already built 
uh, some of that. Uh, at least at this point, it's not in production. So making changes doesn't mean breaking things for people who are potentially using it. Um, but then, you know, once you've delivered a solution and, and things need to change, uh, reworking those things is guaranteed to <laughs> take a lot more time and effort and money to, to get it done. Um, but if we have good architecture and we built software in a better way, I guess we could say, uh, then it will be easier than it might normally be to make changes after we get into the more implementation and delivery stages. And so really architecture is about probably more so the maintainabil maintainability of a project um, than anything. Obviously it needs to serve its purpose, um, but usually when we're taking all the math into effect, it's really the long-term uh, sustainability of the project uh, that is what the architecture drives. Um, so let's take a quick look at what makes a project effective, right? So it's going to solve the problem and it's going to be easy to maintain, right? So like I said, the, the latter is more likely to be uh, what you need software architecture for. So we've got a formula for you. And then you can put real dollar signs to this, um, but this we're, we're basically introducing some principles, things, ways of thinking about things to put real numbers uh, that you can use with clients and figure out, you know, is this worth doing? Do we need to change it? Um, and so on. So, so you can have, let's say, two ways of building a particular project, right? And you could look at it and say, okay, well, <clears throat> the D here represents the desirability of a change, right? Uh, so whatever the, the score is here, the better the score is, you know, the more likely it is we'll go that route as opposed to another route. Um, so we want to take the value of uh, that uh, change now. If we made the change now, you know, what is the um, business value that it brings to the table? And of course, we can use dollars. Um, what is the um, future value that, that this change will bring to the table? Because there could be diminishing returns or it could be you know, effectively uh, incremental or whatever. Uh, but then we divide that by the effort of the implementation plus the effort of maintenance. Um, and so that's where we kind of balance out our costs. Um, so we can kind of figure out, you know, is, is this change worth doing or is one solution or one type of change going to be better for us to make or essentially it could even be more costly. So basic formula but a, a good formula to um to keep in mind especially if you're you're trying to weigh a few different options and figure out what makes the most sense um <clears throat> so one thing to keep in mind too with software architecture is uh technical debt and essentially uh we all know <laughs> uh credit cards they they have you know the big uh interest uh rates and things that can often cause issues uh, financially. Uh, likewise, if you have a, a project where you have not paid too much attention to the architecture, things have gotten a little messy. Uh, over time, as the client asks for more changes, uh, that technical debt is going to be the thing that will bankrupt your project. And we'll see a um, little bit more about this in a bit, but essentially technical debt is literally one of the main things that kills projects, especially like, let's say an enterprise, right? We get enough people working on something and not thinking about how they're doing it. Next thing you know, the business can't uh, continue to fund the project because it's taking an absurd amount of time and development power to keep the project going. So, the first uh, law here that we're going to talk about is the law of change. And that basically just says that uh, the longer that your project or software exists, the more likely that any part of it is going to have to change. Um, so obviously you could have a, a short-lived thing that dies off quickly, um, and that's probably not very useful to anyone, hence why it would die off quickly. 
Uh, but the longer the program exists, it means it's meeting the goals of the client. And the client is going to, over time, have different needs and different requirements that they need from the software. So obviously, that's going to result in changes. So uh, that's just a, a fact uh, of any project is assuming it's worth its salt to the client, it will change in the future. And the longer it's around, the more likely it is to happen. Um, likewise, we have something called the law of defect probability. So this is basically where the chances of introducing a defect is proportional to the size of the changes you make. So if I make a one-line change in code, it's likely not going to cause too many defects, right? Uh, but if I make a I don't know, change to say 157 files, <laughs> the chances of me introducing a defect to the, the software is very, very high. Um, so anytime you make a change and you're thinking about, you know, how should we go about making changes as we continue to build and maintain a project, uh, keep this in mind because this is actually, it's really easy to fall into the trap of, oh, let's just refactor it. Um, and then the reality is you end up with just a lot of things broken, uh, whereas you might be able to say, well, we could change a few lines of code and make that actually work the way it's supposed to without introducing more defects. So uh, this is kind of a, a thing to keep in the back of your mind um, and a nice tool when you're kind of weighing different options uh, to make sure that you're not introducing more technical debt accidentally. Uh, and along those lines, we have the law of simplicity, which is basically saying that um, it's a lot easier to maintain things that aren't complicated, <laughs> right? So, um, and and simplicity, uh, you know, there can be areas of code that are simple and areas of code that are complex, and it's obviously going to be more, uh, a lot easier to maintain those that are uh, simple and clear uh, to anybody who looks at them. And we'll take a little bit of a look at um, how we can how we can simplify some of these things. But um, but yeah, again, as we go through, if you have questions or specific things that uh, uh, come out of these, let us let us know in the chat. Uh, this one is one that is actually a little bit newer to me. I hadn't heard of it before, um, but I like the the concept of it as locality of behavior. So it's basically saying that um, when you look at any piece of code, it should be obvious um, what the behavior of that code is just by looking at it. Um, so if you think about um, a project where you've got um, maybe like some HTML and it's got some data attributes and then you've got some JavaScript and it's got some interactivity with those data attributes, but they live in very different files. It's not at all gonna be obvious from looking at the markup that there's this functionality that goes with it. And if there's this functionality and you're looking at it, it may not be clear where or how that actually interacts with the, the markup. Uh, so, Locality of behavior basically says if you can kind of pull those two pieces together, and so you think of something like Alpine JS or um, you know where you have HTML and it's kind of clear like what the actions are that are happening if you trigger something. Um, that's locality of behavior, um, and so having things closer together so that it's a little more obvious what's going on uh, is something that is going to be huge when you're trying to maintain a project, especially as developers switch out. Uh, so that's a good uh, principle to keep in mind. And anytime it's possible, follow it. I try to do that. Um, but yeah, so like we said, uh, talking about designing systems, you know, what is, um, how do we keep those things simple? And Obviously, one of those things is keeping everything easy to understand. Uh, so a lot of times what that means, keeping it easy to understand, is uh, breaking it down into small pieces, you know, using real words instead of abbreviations, <laughs> um, you know, making sure that you've, um, it could be modularizing code, creating packages, things like that, uh, to to 
kind of break things down in a way that um, makes sense. So you also want to make sure that it, uh, things are easy to modify. And so by easy to modify, you want to make sure that you don't have so many things depending on other things, which are also depending on things related to those things. <laughs> and then you end up with this big spaghetti mess of dependencies. Um, kind of uh, separating that and making sure that you have um, an obvious uh, direction, direction of control going through the, the software. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, you know, if you have two different uh, components, each dependent on each other directly, uh, it's going to be hard to modify one without modifying the other. Um, so you want to be able to make a change without having to be forced to make changes in places, uh, in more places, right? Because the more code that we change, the more likely we break things. Uh, and so the more we have duplication or we have um, these interdependencies, it's going to be a lot harder to modify and we're more likely to cause bugs. Uh, and likewise, we want to make things easy to test. And a lot of times kind of this uh, splitting things out is going to help us with the testing as well. So ultimately, we want to make sure that we have self-documenting code. And so what that means is making sure that we write code in a way that um, ideally comments aren't necessary. Now, that's not to say that comments are never necessary or that we, you know, we shouldn't be writing comments. Um, I think it's definitely helpful, but a lot of times comments in code lie because code changes, people forget to change the comment, and now your comments are lying to you about what is actually happening. So it's better to have the code clean and simple and um, broken down in such a way that it's easy to mentally see what's going on in the code and have the code document itself, essentially. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's better to have comments that are generic in a sense that they describe the overall purpose of a bit of code. And maybe, you know, you might obviously need some comments if there's something really weird going on. That's no, there's no easy way to make it clear. <laughs> um, but otherwise, as much as possible, you know, making sure that your variables um, are named something that makes sense, even if those names are longer um, than some three-letter abbreviation. Um, and then make sure that, you know, you break things down into functions and those functions have specific purposes and we're not throwing a lot of extra things in a function that would cause side effects or things like that. Um, so, by keeping things as simple as we can and having the code self-document, it actually helps prevent bugs from the get-go. Um, and then the other thing we wanna do is make sure that we limit our cognitive load, right? Because part of the problem when it comes to working with code is, well, for one, we have to, we have to read the code to understand what it's doing. Um, and the more code that you read, uh, the more things you have to remember in your head, right? So you're creating that cognitive load when you have a lot of code that you have to keep in your head to be able to make a proper change. So if you have small bits and pieces that make sense as a unit, and then I can say, well, within these five lines of code, I can reason with about what's happening here and I can make a change, then that will allow me to limit the cognitive load and I can use my brain power for <laughs> making the change instead of trying to remember how it all still works. Um, you know, take uh, as another example, you know, uh, 600 lines of code that have changed, you know, that you have to keep in your head uh, and understand before you can actually make a change without potentially really screwing stuff up. Um, it's gonna take you a lot longer to make that change because you have to keep so much information in your head. Um, and this applies for code reviews as well, right? They've shown that if a code review is more than 200 lines of code, then the person who's doing the review, uh, essentially their eyes gloss over at some point and they completely just don't look at the rest of the code. Um, so if you want <laughs> if you want people to properly review code, uh, you also have to limit the cognitive load and keep those uh, pull requests and things small 
in order to uh, to prevent those kinds of issues. Uh, so then we have uh, the dry principle. I think a lot of people have heard this. This is probably one of the more commonly echoed architectural concepts. Um, and of course, of course, don't repeat yourself. Everyone uh, says is basically, well, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, create a copy of uh, any of this code over here because then we have duplication and we have to change things in multiple places and it becomes a problem. And um, so I wanted to kind of dig in a little bit to the dry principle because I think it's relatively misunderstood a lot of times what exactly it means and what it doesn't mean. Uh, and I think that it gets a little bit overused and improperly used. Uh, so I want to kind of talk a little bit about this. <clears throat> so uh, repetition is the mother of learning, uh, says the Latin proverb, right? Which would obviously go against something like the uh, dry principle if you're completely, you know, duplicating things everywhere you turn. Um, but uh, every programmer ever, you know, don't repeat yourself. <laughs> um so, so what does it really mean to use the dry principle? Don't repeat yourself. Um, and I think there's a myth that goes around that basically says, if I was a good coder, all my code would be dry and there wouldn't be any reason uh, for all this repetition or duplication essentially in the code. Um, and while that there is some truth to that, like I said, there's also some things that are not entirely true. So the dry principle is, originates from a book called The Pragmatic Programmer. And it basically states in a very different uh, different manner, uh, every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. Uh, and so we're going to break that down just a little bit. So on the left, um, we're looking at duplication of knowledge is a violation. So from the definition that we just read, Duplication of knowledge, right? So this would be like information, data, things like that. You don't want to have, for example, a checkout system where you have to keep up with prices for products in two different places because the likelihood of you remembering to change the price in all the places, you know, is low. And that duplication would cause serious issues when a customer goes to buy a product and then when they end up on the card, it's a different price or something like that, right? So if, if there's competing data, uh, it's definitely not a good thing. Um, but duplication of code is technically not a violation, right? Um, and so as long as the data has a single source of truth, duplication of code technically doesn't violate the dry principle. The um, <clears throat> Yeah, and uh, we had a comment here in the chat that says the rules engine is really helpful to coordinate those business and system rules in one place and avoid duplicates. Um, yeah, and so we're talking, yeah, exactly. We're talking data, we're talking business logic, um, algorithms, uh, all of these are things that we don't want to duplicate or uh, accidentally, um, you know, have copies of it that are laying around somewhere else. The um, code includes variables, code structures, and function calls, right? So these are things that can be duplicated. Um, reusing variables, um, you know, you might have uh, functions that are used a lot. Um, you probably shouldn't have like two functions that do the same thing, because that would be more like, uh, potentially could be business logic, I suppose. But um, but yeah, like code structures, for example, like let's say we have um, a class that handles functionality um, for the admin in WordPress, and then we have a code or that needs to be accessible on the front end and it feels like the same thing. So we just end up copying that code over or reusing that code for the front end. And then what ends up happening is we start to realize, oh, well, the front end does need to operate a little differently than the back end, but we've essentially, you know, 
are using the same code. We didn't actually duplicate it. If we had duplicated it, we could then change it just for the front end versus the back end. Um, so those are kinds of things where it's fine to duplicate, especially when you know like there's a different context at play and that uh, the future maintainability of the project could depend on that actually being just a copy that we can edit and know that it only affects certain aspects of the software. So ambit, excuse me, ambitious application before there is duplication is uh, what we call premature optimization, right? Uh, so we're trying to eliminate duplication. And uh, in the example of having code that is working on the back end, and then we um, optimize by using the same code on the front end because uh, it seems the same and we don't need to create duplication. Um, we've essentially prematurely optimized in a way that is actually counter counterintuitive or not counterintuitive, counterproductive. Um, but the ambitious application to code structure, um, hold on, I worded that wrong. <laughs> or it seems weird at the moment. Um, yeah, uh, ambitious application to code structures of the drive principle um, results in unnecessary coupling and complexity. So um, by that, we mean, uh, again, that example of let's just use this again on the front end. We've essentially created coupling between the front end and the back end, um, even though we're using just the same code, if that makes sense. <laughs> so, uh, so then we're going to jump over here to the single responsibility principle. So there's there are a bunch of uh, principles that are considered um, uh, object-oriented programming principles. So there's the solid principles. We're not going to cover all of them. Um, I feel like some of them are, especially for like a basic software architecture principles, some of them are very confusing sometimes. Uh, so we're going to kind of stick to some of the more basic things. Um, but the single responsibility principle basically says that um, a class or a module or a particular piece of code should have one and only one reason to change. Meaning that um, if I have, let's say, a function that is supposed to add two numbers, um, there's no reason for me to change that if I need to change how multiplication works, right? Uh, it should only, <laughs> only, only changes the way we add things should go into the function that handles the addition. Um, so that single responsibility principle is fractal, meaning that you can have a module that has a single responsibility for a specific concept, right? So like you might have, for example, an onboarding module. Um, and so the, the concept of onboarding is its single responsibility that it's covering, right? So you wouldn't want to put something related to e-commerce directly into an onboarding module because, you know, maybe that's for the e-commerce module. Um, so we want, you know, we don't want to have those single responsibilities leaking into other things because that's where we start to develop bad architecture and we don't have the proper separation between things to make it easy to swap things out, that kind of thing. But the single, like I said, it's fractal. So you can have a module that covers a specific thing. You could also have a class that covers a specific thing. So if we're talking about onboarding, you might have, I don't know, 10 classes or more um, that might all have their own specific responsibility uh, for, I don't know, handling uh, dependency injection or handling all these things that, you know, handle data for module or, you know, there's a lot of things that would go into a module that in general covers a specific thing. Um, and of course, in a class, you'll have uh, methods, so functions that would uh, have specific responsibilities. So that kind of trickles down all the way. And so you want to make sure you break things up in a way that makes sense so that every bit of code, the smallest bit to the broader general concepts, follow the single responsibility principle. 
Uh, the other principle uh, is the open close principle. And this is one that um, WordPress is a shining example uh, and a very easy example to explain. <laughs> um, but basically the whole idea of the open close principle is that software should be open for extension, but closed for modification. So meaning that using WordPress and writing code for WordPress, I shouldn't be modifying WordPress core, right? Um, doing that means that, um, well, number one, if the WordPress core gets updated, all my stuff goes out the window, right? All my changes to WordPress core. Uh, and then of course, it means that the, the software operates differently and potentially in a buggy way um, and hasn't been tested by millions of people, right? <laughs> and hardened by dozens, uh, well, probably hundreds of developers. Um, so no one should be able to modify WordPress core except the people who work on WordPress core. Uh, but we do want people to be able to write software and extend WordPress, um, which of course people can do by writing plugins um, as well as themes. Um, plugins being obviously the probably better example. Uh, so WordPress gives us a way to extend WordPress by writing plugins without actually modifying WordPress itself. It doesn't give us that control. So it does a good job of following the open close principle. Uh, and likewise, as you write plugins for WordPress, um, your plugins should be extendable. Uh, but your plugin should be modified by somebody who's not the owner of that thing, right? So WordPress gives us hooks and, you know, actions and filters and all those things uh, so that we basically can use those to naturally follow the open close principle in a software that we write for WordPress. Um, and of course, there's other ways of following the open close principle, but I think that's a, a really good example. It should be relatively easy to to grasp for anybody working with WordPress. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about modularity. So um, in general, when we write software, especially as we continue to build things and build things, we start to realize that there's patterns, right? Like things that we do a lot over and over again, code that we have a tendency to copy and paste, uh, and so it would make sense that we might try to modularize that and to kind of create it, its own package, essentially, that would allow us to reuse that code and uh, maintain that code kind of on its own, right? So with modularity, um, we want to make sure that we have clear boundaries between the modules, right? So again, we're talking a module should have like a single responsibility. And as part of that single responsibility, it should, by nature, uh, have clear boundaries as to what it does, what it doesn't do, um, and so on, right? So we would know how it's going to be used, how it's going to be interacted with. Um, and so the other thing we want to do is make sure that a modular, uh, a module, I should say, is um, decoupled. So we want to make sure that a module shouldn't have direct dependencies on each other. Meaning, well, there's two, there's really, we say decoupled, but a lot of times we end up with a couple different scenarios, right? We have tightly coupled things, we have loosely coupled things. Uh, and by loosely coupled, a lot of times that's what we mean when we say decoupled. <laughs> uh, so for example, if I've written code in module A that directly calls functions in module B, then I've created what's called tight coupling, right? I have internal classes and functions and things that I don't realize are being used by some other thing. And then when I need to change this, it will break module A if I change module B, right? Um, and so it's tightly coupled. So things in both modules have to change at the same time in order for um, a change to be successfully made. And that's what we call tight coupling. Loose coupling is when you have the ability to make a change in say module A, 
and module B is dependent on module B, but there's a public API, a um, an interface that can be relied on not to change. So everything underlying in one module can change um, as long as that interactive functionality doesn't change, then no other module needs to change, right? So a good example of this is a module that does logging, right? So you, you might want to log errors to um, an error log. You might want to log errors to a third-party service that handles monitoring errors. You might want to log errors to, I don't know, uh, some random service that puts them up on a screen uh, <laughs> somewhere. It could be anything, right? So being able to, to have the, the idea of, I can call these functions and methods to log something, but I don't have to know anything about how it's being logged. That can be switched out underneath um, without affecting the code that actually would trigger the logging, right? So that's kind of what we mean when we're talking about a loose, loose coupling. And, and again, as we just saw, it's easy to swap things out, meaning that if we wanted to, for example, have uh, code that interacted with service A, and then all of a sudden service A is no longer a feasible service, we could swap it out for service B. And as long as the API that all the other modules or pieces of code are using don't change, then we can make that switch without a problem. Um, so then the other concept here is continuity. So basically this is saying that a requested change should only impact one module in your application. Um, and so it's kind of in alignment with like the single responsibility principle, like as long as you're following that, usually you have continuity. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the concept there comes from mathematics, where it's basically saying that the percentage of impact is related to the percentage of change, essentially. Um, I think the other, other thing we want to look at is protection, right? Like we want to make sure that if an error happens in one module, it shouldn't break another module, right? Like we, would, we don't want to have that kind of uh, leakage of errors or exceptions and, and those kinds of things. So making sure that we have uh, a good way to handle that um, so that we don't we don't pass those errors along. So a lot of times when you're building out those APIs that kind of allow those pieces to communicate, um, it may mean that you handle all of the errors in, you know, if something fails, you might return like an empty value as opposed to uh, something else. But then the other modules would, you know, the expectation is that an empty value is an acceptable response if there is, an error, and then as long as that's built into the communication protocol, then the other modules can handle that without breaking. Um, <clears throat> we don't want to just randomly like throw an exception and not handle it, and then all of a sudden now the other things are breaking because of it. Um, and then of course we're talking extensibility, right? So we want to be able to extend the module for different use cases, and this could mean creating additional modules with additional functionality, but it could also just mean, um, you know, essentially the open close principle within the context of a module. <clears throat> so I think understanding modularity is very important. And that is uh, a big part of, for example, um, thinking about how do we, what do we put in a plugin? Because essentially a plugin is a module. Uh, and likewise, a composer package that you might put in a plugin or a theme is also a module. <laughs> and uh, and so those are, you know, different ways we might package code up and use it in WordPress. Uh, but essentially, uh, the concepts are all there. So when we're talking about kind of these packages and things like that, um, you know, a lot of times people will, <clears throat> like I say, copy paste code. But the problem with copy pasting code is that you copy it from project A to project B, 
and then you copy it from project B to project C. And then somewhere along the way, you patch the bug in project A, but it never made it to project B. So it obviously didn't make it to project C. And then project C got a bug fix, but it didn't get back to where B or A. And so everything's in a different state. And there's no real way to like track, you know, what is the status of the code? Um, how do I know I'm using the, the most recent? Like how, are, how can I release a bug fix across all my projects? Um, <clears throat> these are all issues that you run into if you don't properly have a way to handle um, packages. And essentially what we're talking about here with the reuse release principle is that only things that are released through a tracking system, quote unquote tracking system, can be effectively reused. <clears throat> For the most part, what we normally mean when we say tracking system, um, at least as developers, is usually version control, right? So if I, have all my code related to some module that I've created, let's say. Could be a plugin, could be something else. If I have that all in, uh, let's say, GitHub, then I'm able to uh, track the changes. You know, if I do a patch, I can put it in that repo. Gives it one source of truth for that code, <clears throat> which can also be versioned so that you can include specific versions in your project. And typically, the way that we would do that is using a tool like Composer, in, which is the PHP package slash dependency management tool. Um, and that will essentially serve as our tracking system that allows us to effectively reuse code, meaning that, um, so for example, one of the packages, it's not a plugin, it's just a collection of code, that, excuse me, happens to be in the same repository, in a repository. I have a um, a module, essentially a package that I created, and its sole purpose is to allow setting of an expiration date on a post of any type, any custom post type. And then when that post expiration is hit, it automatically trashes the post. Um, and so that's all that the code does. <clears throat> and it's super handy because it can be used to expire notifications, uh, news items. It could be used to expire promotions, coupons, um, you know, lots of use cases where you might need to expire something, right? Um, so we have a package here that does just that. Uh, but the only way that I can properly reuse it across all of my projects is to have it um, in a repository with, you know, releases being tagged, which then Composer is able to say, okay, you're using version one over here and 1.2 over there. And so, but technically 1.5 is the latest. So anytime you run a command in Composer, you can actually just update that and, um, uh, and then you'll have the latest thing with all the bug fixes and uh, whatever. And of course, if there is a breaking change, then the major version would change, right? So we're using semantic versioning and, and handling all that appropriately so that, um, you know, I can create a package and just reuse it easily. So, <clears throat> um, and that's one of the benefits too about as you become a more seasoned developer, you start to actually build some of these packages that you are able to reuse and um, projects get easier and easier to build because you've already used a lot of the principles of software architecture to create these little bits and pieces of code that can be pieced together with a little bit of glue. And then you're able to complete things much quicker. <laughs> so, uh, Robert C. Martin, who, by the way, if you're interested in the topic of software architecture, is someone I would highly recommend that you look into. Um, he says that a good software architect will delay decisions as long as possible, which sounds kind of lazy. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is that um, a lot of times uh, we have a habit of making decisions too far in advance. Uh, and a lot of times it's better to uh, wait until you have very good reason to go a particular direction, right? Um, so 
uh, wanted to pre present the concepts of the clean architecture that uh, he introduces. And uh, so this will kind of be, we're getting towards the end here, but, um, but basically uh, this diagram that we're looking at, uh, when you're building things, a lot of times you want to try to think from the inside of the circle out. Um, so the things on the outside are the things that um, a lot of times we make decisions about first. Oh, well, you know, we know we need a database and it's going to be MySQL. We know we're going to need, um, you know, a web tool and it's going to be WordPress. Well, it's fine to specialize in those kinds of things and to know in advance that you're building on certain technology. Um, <clears throat> but it's another thing to like prematurely like decide on something before you even know like how the thing needs to operate. Um, so the idea here is that we should work from the inside of the circle out. And we should start with the entities. Um, and so when we're talking WordPress, we're thinking, okay, what are the custom post types? What are the taxonomies? What are the things that we're going to need um, that will make up like the core pieces of the, you know, business logic, right? What is the, what are these entities? And then from there, we step out a little bit into use cases. We say, okay, well, we have, uh, I don't know, a recipe, for example. Like how is a recipe going to be used in the greater concept of what we're trying to build, right? Um, and so, so you might have very specific use cases um, where you you have different business rules that need to be used to change the data associated with an entity or something like that, right? And then as you kind of work your way out, um, then you have the um, the things that interface essentially with your technology um, to present or uh, process, uh, you know, input from from users, that kind of thing. So, um, so ultimately, yeah, you're 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 creating code, kind of working from the inside out, and then what that does, it allows you to um, make better decisions because you're starting with the <clears throat> with the entities and then you're creating a business logic layer and then you're creating the more of like the hard interfaces where it's like okay well this is how this is the way we're presenting the data you know which in wordpress you know be like a php template or something um so these all these things um if we work from the inside out it makes it a lot easier because we are delaying decisions about some of the details that we don't really need to worry about until we get some of the core logic figured out. So <clears throat> if we start with the technology and then how we build things in the technology and then we figure out all the post types, then we're working it totally backwards. And especially if we you know, do all that and then we still don't know what the business logic is um, and we haven't built that in, then we'll be putting business logic in presentation layers and things like that, which is not something we want to do. Um, so um, there's a few resources, uh, if you find this interesting, that I think would be very helpful. Um, so like I said, we've kind of just very, very tip of the iceberg kind of conversation about what these basic principles are. Um, but I would highly recommend, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of these books uh, and things here. So we have the book Code Simplicity is actually um, presents a lot of the like uh, the laws and the formulas and stuff. Some of those things that were in this talk. Um, so I highly recommend grabbing that. It is actually a thin book that is very simple and short <laughs> to the point. Um, I will post the slide deck to the uh, meetup page. And you'll be able to actually just click on the links in this slide deck to go to these resources. Um, but yeah, the Code Simplicity book, it's simple, it's thin, that's it. It's not a hard read, but um, it's written by somebody who has really had <laughs> some harrowing development experiences and has come out for the better. Um, and then uh, Refactoring by Martin Fowler is is a, is a really good book. Um, there's a PHP design patterns book that um, 
is really good about just walking you through like some of the basic um well i didn't know as i was i started out you know self-taught learning wordpress wordpress has grown and since gotten custom post types since i started using it but um so a lot of things have changed but uh, you know you kind of start with doing what you can do and at some point you get to where you're like i would like to create better software right uh, and the design patterns are the thing that for me was like the, the thing that started to unlock a lot of that. So I would recommend um, picking up a, like the PHP design patterns book and going through that and figuring out, okay, what are some of the common patterns? You don't have to follow them perfectly to a T. You can tweak them and customize them. Um, but yeah, there's some, some really good design patterns out there that I think would be inspiring uh, for anybody that's interested in writing better software. Um, and then there's the clean code and clean architecture books um, also that I would recommend. And then of course, there's a couple of links here as well that you can take a look at. But like I said, we'll we'll get those posted up on the um, uh, page. And then um, if anybody has any questions, I think we're about at time. 